zero plus q one x plus uh, q what is it m uh, minus uh, one plus e uh, times x to the m minus one plus e and write e of x as e zero plus e one x plus 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 e um, ah, now it's e and e uh, e minus one well this e refers to maximum number of uh, oh gosh let me use another letter uh, let me use a so e of x is uh, uh, a0 plus a1x plus dot dot plus um, a e minus 1x to the e minus 1. And now simply substitute, right? Simply substitute all the values from 0 to n or p, if you will, right? Here. Right? And you get a system of linear equations. How many of them? You get m plus uh, 2e, right? Which is equal to n equals to p, right? Many equations. And actually, the, this polynomial can, to reduce the dimension can be taken to be 1. Why? Because we can add extra condition that the leading coefficient is 1 because, uh, you know, this polynomial that screens, screens out mistakes can be taken just this, so the largest coefficient is 1. So how many variables do we have? We have, so have uh, m uh, plus e plus, and here we have uh, uh, e minus 1, uh, so this is equal m minus 1 plus 2e, many variables. Am I correct? m minus e, m minus 1 plus, uh, no, 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 this has only, how many variables I have? This has e terms. 1 is missing, so it's e minus 1, so it's m minus 2 plus 2e many variables. Right, so this is how many equations you have, and this is how many variables you have, and you simply solve the system of these equations. Because there will be multiple solutions for E, depending on how many errors you actually have, right? Uh, you can have this system will be, in general, underdetermined. But because of our theorem, any solution that has this property will produce exactly the same uh, quotient polynomial P, right? And solving systems of linear equations can be done extremely efficiently and extremely fast, right? And in fact, this is usually, for example, in uh, fiber optics communications, the speeds are just mind-boggling. So all of this is implemented as super fast circuits uh, because you have to decode the, the bit stream uh, in, uh, in real time. Uh. Uh, but as you see, everything is just simple uh, arithmetic of a finite field plus solving the system of uh, linear equations, which can be done in a very efficient way. Yeah? Okay, so this is how Berlekam and Welch <coughs> uh, solve this problem. And you know, I mean, what is amazing, really, 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 what's amazing here. Yes? Why is that one? Like E, like one time? This one? Um, no, above it. Ah, because E is the polynomial that screens out the zeros here. You can always assume that the leading coefficient of E is one, 
because the only really requirement here is uh, this polynomial, right, product of monomials x minus j will have leading, leading coefficient 1. But you know, this is just a, a nicety. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think that it's even in the notes. So if you really want, you can leave this a variable and have m minus 1 plus 2e many equations. Uh, so, um, uh, and as I say, in, uh, if the number of errors is small, this system of linear equations, the matrix will have very low rank, right? So it will, you will have uh, the whole vector space uh, of uh, um, vectors that are all solutions to the, um, to the same linear uh, system, right? Actually, uh, is it, uh, it's not vector space, it's just a hyperplane, right? Anyhow, so, you can assume that this is one, but it's not critical. So this kind of solves uh, the problem, but not quite in total. Uh, you know, you need another very clever layer. And the problem with errors is, so what do we know? We know that if you have a packet of uh, 200, say, 56 symbols, uh, right? Uh, and 200, the payload is 200 uh, packets. Then uh, you can have it, uh, you can have like 28 erratically uh, received uh, packets, right? But in nature of errors, uh, this is a reasonable assumption in, for some type of noise uh, in which probability of the error is kind of uniformly distributed. But uh, very often the error comes in bursts. So for example, on your CD player, right, if you have a speck of dust, because the track is so minuscule, or, you know, it's so much packed, it will not kill 28 uh, packets that you send. It will kill the whole stream and maybe 20, 30 of them, right? This is whenever you have errors that are in, uh, in a burst, or for example, if you have this RAID uh, system, right? Uh, then, uh, you know, if you have whatever many, nine hard drives and one dies out, well, the whole chunk that is on that uh, uh, hard drive is gone. So how would you solve this problem? Uh, you know, also in, say, television, uh, you have like spark, you know, you have spiky noise that uh, uh, is limited in time, a very broad spectrum, right? But uh, in limited amount of time, and it kills all the packets there. How would you solve this problem? Yes. Send it multiple times? No, that's too expensive. You, it underutilizes the bandwidth. Uh, what can you do before sending anything? Uh, Send like a checksum or something like that? No, what you do is you spread the packets over huge distances in the following way. Say, if this is a bit one, two, three, up to bit eight, and then again, one, two, three, up to eight. You will send first bit of this guy. Then you will say, send first bit of the, uh, so uh, first bit of the next guy. And you will say, send the second bit long distance away. And then the third bit, so you interleave the packets of a gigantic span. So that if you have a burst that kills, right, so now your packets are actually not the original packets, but uh, you know, with the kind of moved around. So even if you kill all of these, well, you are likely to kill, for example, first bit of the first packet and also, you know, um, uh, first bit 
uh, of the second packet and so forth. And uh, um, but the second bit of the first packet is somewhere here, far away, right? So essentially, if you have a bit stream one zero one, you take one from the first, then somewhere here you put next one, next one, and zero, and then you take the next packet and you put uh, his digit here, first digit here, second digit here and third digit here, and so forth. And there are various schemas how to scatter the bits so that you can survive um, uh, kind of bursts of noise, bursts of errors, uh, right? And that's very uh, clever. This is done in, for example, digital uh, television. So. Yeah, this is so two very interesting kind of tricks. Uh, I mean, everything is really totally what is shocking about Berlekamp and Welch uh, proof. It's totally elementary, and in fact, it's simple. Even the idea is simple. Find a polynomial that screens out the errors, uh, because the redundancy is sufficient to still have everything uniquely distributed, uniquely determined. But it took uh, probably how many, uh, uh, 30, 30 years uh, until this was discovered and which really made the error correction codes uh, widely applicable, not just to deep space communication, but actually in all sorts of applications. Okay, uh, and uh, another beautiful thing about this is now error correction codes uh, are used in this algorithm that controls the power. So you know that your machinery can survive 28 errors right out of 256. If, and you count, uh, right, you can count the number of errors. Uh, this requires a bit, you know, because then you don't, uh, once you get the polynomial P, you cannot rely on Q and E because E might be screening off uh, also some correct values. But once you get P, you can evaluate P at all uh, values and see how many of them are actually different from what you received. And you keep this error rate, say, to about 14 errors. Why? Well, this gives you enough space uh, to, you know, to be extremely likely that the next packet will be received correctly, right? And if you see that this drops to, say, only seven errors, you reduce your target gamma. And uh, if you go start getting close, if you get, say, 20 towards 20 errors, right? Uh, you increase your gamma, your target gamma that you are chasing with your signal to interference ratio. So you see, it also, the, what I really love about this piece is that uh, all sorts of things uh, kind of magically fit together, right, and allow the design. And it's really a brilliant design um, that, uh, um, and uh, you know, there is uh, some amount of mathematics involved in designing this, uh, but uh, really nothing outlandish. So um, it's very well worth learning this stuff. Uh, okay, let's now go back to business, namely to Google. And what we want to see now is uh, how Google sells uh, its ad space. Uh, but probably what I'm going to tell you will have these days no resemblance with reality, because Google was caught uh, by this European Commission to uh, actually skew the search results uh, so that they favor Google business interests. Uh, so it's kind of abuse of monopoly, and they want they fire, find Google with uh, how many uh, like several billion, several billion. So 
And you know, initially, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the motto of Google was do not do, do not be evil, something mm -hmm. like that. But as their profits grow, lo and behold, money corrupts everyone. So now they are, and you know, they used to be kind of a paradigm of what Microsoft should have been, but it is not. Well, tough luck. Somehow <coughs> multinationals end up, not to mention that they evade, they employ vast number of lawyers and accountants and keep money in offshore accounts. So in Australia, they pay peanuts in taxes, right? But, uh, Bloody globalist. Oh, sorry? Nothing. So, um, so, uh, so what am I going to tell you? You take it with a grain of salt. Um, because God knows what kind of algorithms they use at the moment. Okay, so what is what is an auction? You know, so auctions are actually at least we have documented history from the Roman times, and interestingly enough things didn't change uh, very much. So uh, if, you, uh, if you are trying to buy a property in Sydney housing market, you are all likely to face uh, an auction, right? Um, so, and there are two types of standard uh, auctions. Well, uh, first, they can be kind of public, in which uh, all the participants can hear the bids of other side, or they can be closed in which, for example, the government sends, uh, uh, makes a competition for some big government job, then each corporation makes a bid that is not accessible to other bidders, and then the, uh, the um, uh, the, the government decides whom they give uh, the, uh, the, the job, right? And whom do they give the job? To the best bid? No, they give it to their bodies, uh, right? <laughs> uh, they give it to this guy obeyed and... Uh, okay, dokey. So after this cynical remark, an anti-social remark, um, so you have ascending, among the open auctions, you have the ascending and descending one. What's the difference? Well, <coughs> in the ascending auction, uh, the auctioneer right, starts with some uh, unrealistically low price. Why does he start with unrealistically low price to kind of stimulate as many people to bid as possible <coughs> so that uh, eventually the highest price is achieved. <coughs> and then he raises the, uh, uh, the then people bid and uh, the price starts going up until someone proposes the price that no one else uh, is, uh, going, uh, is willing to match, right? And of course, he gets the, uh, the property for uh, the amount of money that uh, he uh, proposed, right? Uh, on the opposite direction, you can start with the highest, with some unrealistically high uh, asking price that no one is actually willing to pay, and then you this you decrease it in small steps uh, until someone uh, says that he's buying for uh, this amount of uh, money. Okay, so you would expect uh, that uh, when Google sends the, uh, sells the ad space uh, to maximize their profit, 
they also have some form of an auction. Of course, it's not the company people that um, do the auction, but it's an agent, right? A, a, a program that you input what's your highest possible bid, and then your agent kind of proposes um, uh, higher and higher bids until uh, uh, you win this proposed ad space. Now, that's kind of an oversimplified version because uh, very often the same company bids for several, say, keywords, uh, right? Uh, if you are, say, a tourist uh, uh, kind of travel agent and uh, uh, you want to advertise some cheap flights, uh, you want to bid for keywords such as vacation, you also want to bid for keywords uh, uh, such as uh, cheap uh, flights and uh, lots of different ones, right? So, in fact, uh, the auction will be simultaneous auction, so auctions happening at the same time for multiple uh, items, right? So, it looks like problem solved, but uh, it's a little bit more difficult than that. Uh, because uh, the auction mechanisms should be designed in such a way that people bid uh, truthfully, right? So that, uh, uh, and so how is this done? <coughs> in early days, uh, uh, online advertisers simply charged the, the people, the companies that advertise per view. What does it mean? Uh, they would count how many people uh, came to this particular web page uh, and then charge the advertisers according to the number, it's called number of views. This is really a kind of uh, inadequate method simply because uh, uh, if you go to a web page, it doesn't mean at all that you paid any attention to any particular app. So you are being charged for something that you absolutely have no benefit from. And soon people figure out that and uh, whenever there is opportunity, people start business on that basis. So uh, there was a startup called uh, I think it was called Go To, that would charge, uh, that would sell a space for, you know, uh, subscribing uh, kind of web pages uh, per click, right? So it would charge only uh, the advertiser if the visitor of that web page actually clicked at the ad, right? Uh, and now, of course, not all uh, positions uh, on the page are equally likely to, uh, to are likely to get equal number of clicks, right? So, for example, when you do search, uh, Google gives you what it's called a sponsored link links, I think, right? So the first few, sometimes the first ten items, annoyingly. annoyingly are actually paid advertisements. And of course, we kind of look uh, on a web page from top to bottom, at least to find where the ads stop. So you are much more likely kind of to pay attention to first few ads. So it's uh, logical that Google would charge more for these uh, places, right? Um, so how do you determine really it's one thing to say uh, that uh, top places are more uh, prominent and more likely to produce financial benefit uh, than the bottom places well you can do statistics you can simply count how many times people click on the first ad how many times they click on the second uh, and so forth and in fact, the statistics do show that uh, 
uh, the number of clicks, uh, say per hour, decreases significantly as you go down the list. So then it's natural that uh, uh, these uh, um, positions that are called uh, high um, uh, click through, I think, is it uh, the terminology? Click through rate uh, are more expensive than those uh, that are cheaper, right? Than those that have a smaller throughput. Uh, but how expensive, how much should Google charge for the first, uh, say, um, uh, for the top space, how much for the second? Well, this is done by an auction mechanism, right? And um, uh, the auction mechanisms are designed to stimulate truthful bidding, right? To, uh, so how is uh, this uh, supposed to work? Well, notice that these physical auctions in which the price either decreases or increases, well, they do stimulate truthful bidding because you don't, uh, say, if the price is decreasing, you don't bid for something that you cannot afford, right? Um, and uh, uh, but how is this done online? So to explain this, uh, actually things are somewhat tricky. But uh, let's look at a particular example. Assume that uh, you have uh, just uh, one item on sale, right? And you have uh, n many bidders, uh, right? And uh, they bid for the item, and you say the guy, this is the highest uh, highest bidder, then this is the second uh, highest uh, bidder, and so forth. And naturally, the highest bidder gets the item, but he pay, pay, pays the price of the second highest bidder, not his bid. So this looks like a funny business, right? Why would he pay uh, the second highest? But interestingly enough, this method ensures truthful bidding. It's counterintuitive because it would look that uh, if this is the case, why don't I just propose some outrageous price? And then I win the item, but I pay the price of the second highest bidder. Well, unfortunately, this, of course, doesn't work because if everyone uh, reasons in that way, all the agents can reason in that way, and they will all propose uh, outrageous prices and end up paying uh, whoever gets uh, um, will pay an outrageous uh, price. So actually, this is not a counter-argument. Uh, let's see why this um, works. Um, it's kind of the idea is to disentangle the fact that you won from the price that you will pay. So let us prove now that uh, the optimal strategy in such a bidding is to bid really for your value, for the value of your object, of that object for you, right? So that you will, in fact, be stimulated to bid precisely how much this is valuable for you. Why is this so? Well, this is the idea. So let's prove uh, that this is the case. So prove uh, best strategy in terms of the value of, uh, sorry, in terms of the expected value of the outcome is uh, to beat uh, the true value 
that item has for you. Uh, let's, to prove that, let's assume opposite. Assume that, in fact, if, my, if the value of this item for me is B, is, uh, say, V, I should actually bid B that is smaller than the value of, uh, my, the value of this item to me. Right? Now, when assume that you actually are the winner. Well, if you are the winner, then uh, it means that the next bid, so that's bid B1 and with value 1, it means that the next winner, the next bid, B2, must be smaller than uh, B1. In fact, the only moment, the only situation in which you bidding a smaller value than V can matter, right, if uh, uh, this, if uh, the bid of the second uh, person is above uh, your bid B1. If this is B2, above uh, 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 above the bid B1, right? Because if the bid B2, right, is below B1, it will have no impact at all, no matter whether you bid V or B1. If B1 is uh, above uh, uh, B2 and you win the auction, it doesn't matter that you bid less because you will anyhow end up paying B1, right? On the other hand, assume that maybe it's better if you bid some B1 that is higher than the value V, right? Now, when can this matter? Well, this can matter if B2 is below uh, V, you would win it uh, even with bid V. So the only difference can happen if actually B2 falls between B1 and V. But if B2 is uh, uh, above value V1, then you will end up, you will win the, the bid, but you will end up paying more than what is this uh, value of this item for you, right? So you will be actually at a loss. Just a question. Yes. So are you saying that everyone is only allowed to make one bid? It's, um, not, it's not like an actual auction where everyone make like, bids just keep coming in and you can up the bid that's already been made kind of thing? Uh, you can do it also for uh, <coughs> dynamic bidding, so, but the question is, I guess, then what is your limit that you can, what you set out to limit for your bid? Uh, Right, so the limit for your bid uh, is the highest price that you are willing to pay, and uh, then uh, this argument applies, right? So even if it's dynamic, it still works. It still works. Okay, so I uh, let's uh, stop here because I have a doctor's appointment downtown. And we will continue next time. This is all from the textbook. And it's actually pretty tricky. We, we can show that uh, this strategy does not work when people bid simultaneously for multiple items. And then the, the, the uh, bidding mechanism that the website should implement is actually much trickier. So uh, read the... the uh, the book and uh, next week is the break, right? Yeah. Okay, so have good time, enjoy writing your major proposals, right? And I'll see you, have a good time, and I'll see you in uh, two weeks' time.